Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369 0703 768 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Father, we hand over this session to you. We ask for your presence and we ask for your blessing. We ask that you lead us so that at the end of it, oh God, you will equip us to go back home, Lord, to live well and to do ministry correctly. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right. Thank you, Brother David and Stagiata or again, uh, standing to coordinate our family clinic this afternoon. We would like to go ahead. We have looked at leakages, and I think it's sufficient, isn't it? Now we want to look at what causes loss, loss of pressure, loss of focus, loss of momentum, loss of zeal, loss of power for effective ministry, and these losses that emanate from the home. What makes, you know, so when we use the word loss of pressure, that is a, a, a loss of, of capacity because there's diversion, a loss of focus. You know, when, when, when Jesus said, if your eyes be single, the whole of your body will be full of light in Matthew chapter 6. But double or evil, how much will darkness fill your life? So when a husband or his wife, they have lost their focus, they have lost a single focus on the purpose of God. So my wife is going to start us off to look at what are issues that bring loss of pressure, loss of focus, loss of zeal or loss of momentum that also leads to loss of power for ministry. But this comes because of the distraction at home and all of that. I want my wife to start helping us to look at how do we deal with losses of these things and how do we avoid them? How do we build relationships that we are maintaining our focus, our zeal, and we are not losing the power to, to serve God. Yes, uh, Sister Shadi. Right. Um, looking at uh, certain things that normally causes loss of pressure, loss of focus in the family, of course, the first of it is sin. Mm. Sin in the life of the man, sin in the life of the woman. Sin deflates. Mm. It deflates. It deflates the anointing. It brings us to zero level. Uh, and we cannot overemphasize the fact that we must avoid sin. Any displeasure to God will deflate us. Anything that comes, you know, the Bible says in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, it says the ears of the Lord are not dull that he cannot hear. His hands are not short that he cannot uh, save. But your sins have separated between you and God, which means your sin has caused, a, caused the deflation. There is no flow. Whatever you have collected will just deflate. Sin is one thing to avoid. And uh, another scripture says, love not the world, nor the things 
of the world. Because whosoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, the love of the world causes deviation, distraction, loss of focus, loss of momentum. Mm -hmm. I think if we read that scripture, it may help us a little bit better. Okay. Um, uh, that's uh, 1 John 2. We're going to read verse 15 and 16 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Mm. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the, is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Uh, if you read it from um, Living Bible, it becomes a little bit clearer, especially uh, verses 15 and 16, even 17. Stop loving this evil world and all that it offers you. For when you love these things, you show that you do not really love God. Mm. For all these worldly things, these evil desires, the craze for sex, the ambition to buy everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and importance. These are not from God. They are from this evil world itself. And the world is fading away, and these evil forbidden things will go with it. But whoever keeps doing the will of God will live forever. So, the love of the things of the world also causes loss of pressure. It causes inefficiency. It causes a division of focus. Instead of focusing on God, God who says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. But when we now shift to the things of the world, the things we think we need, and our focus comes on that, it also deflates us. It causes loss of focus. It causes loss of momentum. Mm. You can't pursue the, thing, the two things at the same time. Mm. Once you focus on the world, you have left God. And when you focus on God, you have left the things of the world. And God will surely add whatever is needed unto you. So that is one crucial thing that could cause uh, the love of pressure, loss of focus, loss of momentum. Mm. Sin, the love of the world. Mm. And then the other thing I want to point at is um, what Ephesians chapter 5 calls dissipation. Mm. Dissipation. Ephesians 5 verse 18. Mm. He says, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Mm. Do not be drunk with wine. And when we talk about wine, it's not only the wine of alcohol. Mm. Anything that makes us drunk will dissipate us. Intoxicate. It will intoxicate. It will drain the anointing. Anything we are drunk with, mm. somebody can be so drunk, even with joy. Mm. Eh, you are happy about something that has happened. You can be so drunk that it will waste your energy. It mm. will seep spiritual energy, sap spiritual energy. So don't be drunk. Don't be intoxicated with joy, even with sorrow. Mm. Sorrow is another thing that can dissipate that can waste us, that can leak away the anointing. When we are overdrawn, when we are over, overcome, overwhelmed, even with sorrow, no matter what happens to us, God is saying, look, you are carrying something precious. You are carrying something delicate that 
when you are drunk with anything and overwhelmed with sorrow, with happiness, overwhelmed with friendship or relationship, and you are drunk with this, it can dissipate, it can leak away the anointing. It can, it can leak away. It can make us to have loss of pressure. Our focus can shift in the twinkle of an eye. And before you know it, you have to start again looking to God for help. So there are many things like that that can make us to dissipate and lose momentum, lose our focus, lose pressure. We must watch against all this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, maybe before we go away from these issues that you have raised, it means then that uh, if, for example, the wife, let's say is the wife that became uh, uh, engrossed with the love of the world, the love of the world. She just suddenly fell in love with clothes or she fell in love with uh, 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 appearance that she just suddenly fell in love even with the making of her hair that she can spend hours and I've seen that it has happened nowadays that some some air do takes days mm. to finish. Some air do cost thousands. When a woman is engrossed with the love of the world, the love of things that are going on in the world, it will cause <clears throat> dissipation. And if the husband also got engrossed with a sense of importance, achievement, in such a way that their matrimony is no more their priority. When a woman's priority is no more how to, how to please God, how to please my husband, how to help my husband to be the best that he could be, there's a loss of focus. When the woman begins to be engrossed with the love of money, I hope you know that all these things have brought dissipation to many families. So can you help us read that first Peter chapter three, where the Bible again was restating what should be the priority, the priority of the woman, the priority of the man, so that we don't lose focus. We don't become just a, a, a marriage that is not fulfilling the purpose of God. Even if you have many cars, but you are not fulfilling the purpose of God. Can you imagine because the love of the world has made people to build big houses to the extent that now Madame has her own special room. The husband is on his own. This is because they were now appearing to be blessed, but that blessing has scattered their marriage. They now have separate beds. And if the man wants to see the woman, has to knock. They want to say, look, I'm very busy. These are all dissipation. Sometimes we are drunk. Mommy said, you can be drunk with joy. You can be drunk with achievement. You can be drunk. You can imagine that there are wives that are so consumed with their career to the extent that their marriage is now secondary. I want to make it, I want to make it. I just want to make it. That's why she's flying here and there and the marriage is scattered. The purpose for which God wanted this male and female to become a channel, a, a, a vessel for, for, for his purpose on earth is scattered because the wife is now is selling kunu here, is uh, importing clothes there, is uh, the one, uh, a, a contractor, and the husband supposed to be in the ministry, there's a distraction. He couldn't focus again. So will you please read that First Peter chapter 3 for us? First Peter 3 from verse 1 to verse 6. Mm. 
Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. How does this sound in the Amplified Bible? Amplified. 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 Whichever Amplified. Yes, Amplified. Okay. Yes. Amplified. In like manner, you married women, be submissive to your own husbands, subordinate yourselves as being secondary to and dependent on them, and adapt yourselves to them. So that even if any do not obey the word of God, they may be won over, not by discussion, but by the godly lives of their wives, when they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves. Together with your reverence for your husband, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect, defer to, rever him, to honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, to adore him, that is to admire, praise, to be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. Let not yours be the merely external adorning mm. with elaborate interweaving and knotting of the hair, mm. the wearing of jewelry and changes of clothes. But let it be the inward adorning and beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, which is not anxious or wrought up, but is very precious in the sight of God. For it was thus that the pious women of old who hoped in God were accustomed to beautify themselves and were submissive to their husbands, adapting themselves to them as themselves secondary and dependent upon them. It was thus that Sarah obeyed Abraham, following his guidance and acknowledging his headship over her by calling him Lord, Master, Leader, Authority. And you are now her true daughters, if you do right, and let nothing terrify you, not giving way to hysterical fears or letting anxieties unnerve you. And now I'll read verse 7. In the same way, you married men. In the same way. You see, when they use the same way, that means just as we are giving instruction to women, if you are becoming a cosmetic man, that you are spending uh, so much on very costly uh, uh, cosmetics, perfumes, you see, some men, I don't understand. The, the, the kind of amount of money they place on perfumes, when you go and check, how much does it cost? For a whole month, it could have been what the family would be eating. But you consume see that because you just want to smell nice outside there. Why we are not saying you should be on camp? These things preoccupy you. Spend so much money on things that are not building and adding up to the family. So it said in the same way. So nobody should think that we are talking only about women here. God said in the same way, that is whatever the woman is coming on because it's likewise, 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 in the same way you married men, you must live considerately with your wives, with an intelligent recognition of the marriage relation. 
honoring the woman as physically the weaker, but realizing that you are joint heirs of the grace, God's unmerited favor of life, in order that your prayers may not be hindered and cut off. Otherwise, you cannot pray effectively. So all the things that we have highlighted about what causes losses, either on the side of the wife, on the side of the husband, we need to see it. Because our marriage itself, God is expecting us to become a vessel, a channel through which the family could be helped. You know that when you live expensively, you are mortgaged. There are families that cannot stand now because they are neck deep in debt. You borrow in order to settle another debt. So you move from debt to debt. Why? Why are you unable to maintain a family that is not under pressure? How can you be a minister and every time people are knocking on the door and they are coming to ask for their money? How is your wife borrowing from house to house? What is it that is making you unable to live on what God has given you? So we are talking about a minister's home that is focused. You are not in that community to be borrowing money. You are not in that community for a cosmetic parade, fashion, fashion parade. Your wife doesn't have to wear the most expensive dress in the church. If you have simple dresses and you keep it neat, ironed, it's okay. It's okay. And yet they say, oh, this pastor and his wife, they are not a burden to us. They don't beg us for anything. When we get to their house, whether it is garden egg we have or granite, they will, start, they will even entertain us. Simple things. They are not expensive. Oh, nowadays pastors are becoming expensive on the congregation. The kind of allowance that you are demanding now, hey, is extraneous. I think you are becoming a civil servant than God's servant. Now, and yet it is you and your wife that needed to regulate that so that you can be a blessing, a channel of blessing to the congregation. So we are there with loss of uh, focus, loss of momentum, loss of zeal, loss of power. There may be other causes that makes men to lose the strength of ministry because they are distracted. Again, I would like just to say that disagreement, disharmony in the family causes loss, loss of power. Can you imagine that you cannot sit down and prepare to hear God and to bring the word from the Lord to the congregation? Because throughout the night, you quarrel. Throughout the night, you are arguing over issues that are not important. So we want to note that, that as a, a couple that God is using to bring about the move of God among his people, we need to look at every issue of distraction, every issue of uh, dissipation. I think the right word you use today is dissipation. Anything that dissipates you, anything at all. The last thing I want to say before we leave that point, Distraction with family, with uh, extended family. Sometimes you are engrossed with inter uh, interruption of extended family. You have not put them where they ought to be. So they have become a problem, a distraction to you. So we want to look at that all together. Anxiety is another one. All right. I think you should say it loud. Mm. Anxiety also dissipates. Mm. Instead of concentrating and believing God, mm. whom you serve for every need, whether physical need, spiritual need, even emotional needs, mm. uh, when we are anxious, we can focus on God and his work at the same time. Mm. Mm. And what the Bible says is, 
do not worry about anything, but pray about everything and give him thanks when you receive the answers. Mm. And this anxiety majorly is about, about tomorrow. Sometimes the husband is, I mean, the wife is worried. Say, if I die now, where will I be buried? And you're asking, do you want to die tomorrow? He said, no, 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 God forbid. No, God forbid, I bring that. And yet he's thinking of where he'll be buried. He didn't want to die in the next 10 years. Not planning to die in 20 years time. And yet he's worried about where to be buried. What concerns you about that? And do you know that when somebody is dead, whether you bury him or not, it's not his own problem. Eh? Why do you worry about what you don't even want? So anxiety. And it causes anxiety mm. uh, now causes sometimes separation in mm. the place of work. Wow. Instead of working together and, and trusting God for your needs, because you are anxious about tomorrow, you are anxious about money to pay school fees, and to take care of the family, you see the wife walking 100 kilometers away mm. from where the man is in the name of, let me help the family. No, whatever help that you want to render that will cause separation of what God has joined together, that help is not suitable. Mm. It will just leak away the anointing. It will make you to be deflated and you can't focus. Even the man you have left cannot focus. It becomes vulnerable. Vulnerable. When you are not there, church girls will say they are coming to help me fry meat. And from frying meat, something else will be fried. You have to be deliberate and be careful. And let me ask our coordinator if he has something to add to this before we move uh, immediately to our next point. In the message, caught my yes. attention. And I'll just read it and then I'll use a word there to make the statement I want to make. It says, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. <laughs> Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. <laughs> but whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Mm. You see, loving the world isolates you from the Father. Mm. And once you are isolated from the Father, it, you will also isolate yourself from your spouse. Mm -hmm. Whatever affects a person's relationship with God, also affects his or her relationship with the spouse as well. Mm -hmm. So when you isolate yourself from God, you will definitely leak. And you raise an issue which I believe is very important, that most ministers have become very expensive to their members. And it is all because they live in competition. Mm -hmm. My classmate, my colleague on the other side, has this, has that. And then he, or she, he wants to have the same thing also. And then you find that the minister is visiting members to ask for favors to the extent that when there is a knock at the door or when a car pulls up and they see that it is the pastor, the member is worrying himself. What has he come for now? Mm. What is he going to ask for now? They are not happy that you are coming to visit them, but they are worried about the demand you will make on them. So isolating yourself from God will isolate you not only from your spouse, but even from your members. Thank you. Yeah, All right. I just wanted to add to some of the things that are getting us drunk. And as a result, this dissipation uh, is food, even food. Uh, some of us ministers are eat and eat to the point that we cannot uh, sleep well, mm. and uh, sometimes we're drunk with football entertainment. Yes, some of us are drunk with uh, fear of retirement. Mm. You know, because of that, you are cutting corners to make sure you have built a house. You have done things that you are leaving behind. It removes your attention from the main demand. What you are supposed to be doing. 
Some of us are drunk with ICT. Mm. ICT is a terrible thing that is getting many ministers drunk and lost from their families. They can be in the same room, but they are not together for hours. Everybody is on his own. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, some, some, some is movies. They watch movies late into the night. And so they cannot get up to pray and seek the face of God. That is a lot of dissipation. There can't be power. You, you are weak physically, and so you are weak spiritually. Some are drunk with the little fragments of blessings that God has in mercy shown in ministry. So everywhere they go is the story of what they have accomplished. And mm -hmm. before you know it, like we had in the teaching this morning, it's not Christ that is being presented anymore. It is me and what I have done. Mm -hmm. And so these are losses to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I know that uh, our brothers and sisters in the centers, they are following us and they are seeing the issues that God is uh, pointing at. Uh, this world and all is wanting, 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 it is endless. Once you enter into the world system, you can never have enough. And it's better never to love the world Otherwise, you will lose the love of the Father. So may God help us in the name of Jesus Christ. I think all the issues that we have raised already began to deal with the narrowness in perspective. Loss of that heavenly vision. Heavenly vision. When your marriage becomes earthly bound, mm. hi, you will enter into many, many bottlenecks. If you remember that we are pilgrims, one of the things that has been a challenge to me is how, how did Abraham, how did he maintain his pilgrim spirit? The Bible says he dwelt in tents. Even though this man is rich, he was rich. He was rich in cattle, he was rich in this, he was rich in that, but he dwelt in tents. Basically, the Bible said uh, they look for a city whose builder and maker, architect is God. They were looking for a city with foundation. They know that whatever is in this world will pass away. So as couples, couples in ministry, we need not to lose our sense of being pilgrims. They say they lived in tents. They, they, they knew that we are in ministry. We are not here to become a statute. So their mind is focused. God can move us to another place tomorrow. God can send us to go and do something else tomorrow. God can ask us to go and uh, open another field somewhere tomorrow. They are pilgrims. And husband and wife must recognize that if they will not enter into the bottlenecks, of loss of perspective and loss of focus and loss of the vision, heavenly vision that God had given us. You want to say something about that before we move? About the narrowness? Narrowness and loss of perspective and bottlenecks. Of course, when, when the focus is lost, mm. you can't see beyond your nose. Um, when the heart is distracted and diverted to other things, the vision is narrowed. You can't see ahead, you can't see far. Uh, but if God will help us to overcome that in such a way that our heart is focused, you will see God enlarging our coast. You see God enlarging our perspective. We'll be able to see beyond where we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. it, it's important to weed off all these things first, and then God will take us to higher grounds. Amen. Amen. All right. I think <laughs> I would like us to move away from that. We are dealt with all the losses, the narrowness in perspective, 
and bottlenecks, things that come to block what God wants us to do, blockages in being free with each other and being a free channel for God to convey the grace of God to those who are waiting to drink from our bowels. Now, I want us to now take that big issue that the word of God raised, two are better than one. As if honestly for us to fulfill the purpose of God in our lives, the word of God is very emphatic that we are not together in marriage as an addendum. It's not for decoration. It is that two, two of us, the male and female, is better than one. So we're going to ask Sister Gerta to help us read our, you know, we have read this passage from one clinic to another. It looks like we just have to keep reading it. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 92. Uh, Sister Gieta, will you read that for us as we now go on? Ecclesiastes to the chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Amen. Amen. Now I will allow Sister Shade to begin to help us, you know, open the issues that are raised here. We're going to be discussing when Bible said. Two are better than one. We want to discuss this passage in the light of becoming victorious and becoming effective channels of God's ministry to the body of Christ, over which we are overseers as apex clergy. We want to discuss each of the issues in some details. And so we want to look at two are better than one when he talks about bringing forth fruitfulness, and good reward in our labor. So let me uh, wait for Sister Shade to open up that for us. Uh, two are better than one. That if a man will stand together with his wife, even in the work to which God has called them, they will get greater, greater reward. So will you please begin to speak into all this as we take them one by one, as the Lord will help us. The first issue noted in that scripture is that two are better than one. And this is the word of the Lord. This is God telling us that two are better than one. And the two in this case is talking about a man and his wife. Even though you can partner with somebody to do some works, but honestly, the one who will know the other person better is the husband and wife. The two that will bring a reward, the two that can really become one is the man and his wife. And he says two are better than one. If we are going to be effective channels of blessings to our generation, to our congregation, to the body of Christ, and to our nations. God is saying two are better than one. And to me, first of all, I'm seeing that as um, not, um, not being married and yet be alone. Be, you know, be married and yet independent of each other. Working independently, serving independently, doing ministry independently. Mm. You will not in any way serve the purpose of God and be a correct channel of blessing that way. They are married, but it, they are not married. The First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11 says, Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, 
nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman come from the man, even so man also comes through the woman, but all things are from God. We are not independent of each other, even in our making. The man, the woman comes from the man. God took a rib from the man to make the woman. So we can be independent of each other. And in the issue of birth, even the man cannot claim superiority in any way because the man also comes through the woman. So we cannot be independent of each other. So it's, you know, God's counsel is combined efforts, combined together, and your two will be better than one. I think it's in Deuteronomy also that the Bible says one shall chase a thousand mm. and two put tens of thousands to flight. It's not just that one will chase a thousand and two will chase two thousand. Mm -hmm. The effectiveness in ministry is very clear in that aspect that there will be tens of thousands when you combine efforts, not just two thousand. It's not... Uh, um, uh, arithmetic or something mm -hmm. of two, one plus one equals two. No, is multiples, tens of thousands when you combine efforts. So mm -hmm. two are better than one. If we're going to be um, correct channels of blessings mm -hmm. and God will reward our efforts, he said they will have a good reward for their labor. Mm -hmm. We must combine efforts. We must not be independent of each other, seeing that we were not even made like that. Mm. One comes from the other. One comes through the other. Mm. We cannot labor independently and expect God to work uh, effectively through us. All right. So before we go from that point, it actually means that if the man, as we read before, that God took a rib out of him. Which means what could have made him complete is what God has put in the wife. There's a deficiency in him that has been made sufficient in the woman. We cannot overemphasize that. That when the two of them now come together, what it means is that the supply, the supply of grace, the supply of spirit, the supply of wisdom, the supply of competencies coming from both of them combines to give, instead of arithmetic progression that you are trying to do, it gives what we do in mathematics, we call geometric progression. What comes is geometrical. It comes, you know, in a kind of angular multiplication, it just increases. As we are passing, it just multiplies. It's a multiple. Now, but if they are different, one here, one here, each one will bring the uh, deficiency into what he's doing. So there'll be incompleteness. You may appear competent, but your competence is incomplete. Because the woman that God has brought to you was meant to be an addition. <clears throat> it's supposed to be a fill-up of what you don't have. So when he said two are better, in fact, he said, woe unto him who is alone. Kai. He said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a help made for him. Now, if you look at... Um, uh, how the message put it. He said, it's better to have a partner than go eat alone. <laughs> Some of you, you are lone rangers. And what you are doing alone, it's not, it doesn't, you know that if you are happy alone and you are smiling alone and you are talking to yourself alone, people that see you on the road, they say, this man, 
is he needs to go to psychiatry. They will catch you quickly. They say he's talking alone, he's smiling alone, he's dancing alone, he's jumping alone. Ah, it's terrible to be alone. Mm. Even to share your joy together is more healthy. To work together. One of the things I want to add in this matter is the fact that one eye, what one eye sees cannot be compared with when two eyes are looking at it together. What you thought is so wonderful, allow your wife to look at it. By the time she brings her perspective, you will see all the areas that you didn't see. Now, she's not coming to criticize you. She's coming to bring in perspective of details the that female, you may not see. The female perspective. The female perspective. It's different from the male perspective. You see, so if the female perspective of what you are doing has not been added, the male perspective is not complete. That's why sometimes when you just meet men who are just walking alone, they are okay, but they only have a male perspective of what they are doing. The female perspective that will have brought robustness, that will have brought completion, that will have uh, filled up all the gaps, is not there. So, my dear brothers, let me say to you, even when you are preaching the gospel, if only you allow your wife to bring a female perspective, your message will be bigger to be more complete. Sometimes you say, well, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. If you will hear the Lord very well, you will have said, share that matter with your wife and see how it will come out. It will come out. If your wife is a woman of the spirit, if a, because the Bible said there is a portion of the spirit in the marriage, if you allow the spirit of marriage in every detail, including even your message preparation, your messages will be more wholesome, rounded. When we write materials, when we write books, when I finish putting all the structure down and my wife comes to look at it and brings the female perspective and the wisdom of God in her life, the thing comes out well. Two, in every sense, is better than one. Excuse me, brother. Agree when God said it is not good for you to be alone. Just know that what God says is not good is not good. It's not good. Eh? Can you imagine that you are dressed up and your wife is not there to bring the female perspective of how you are looking? Sometimes you have already gone out. You forgot that you have not combed your hair. Eh? Sometimes you are going out you forgot that there's no handkerchief in your hand. So when you are now preaching and you are sweating, you are doing like this. You are doing like this. That's a man who did not allow his wife <laughs> to dress him up when he was gone. <laughs> I know your wife would have said, what of your handkerchief? Have you taken this? And he said, no, don't worry me. I'm going to have something to do. Only when you now get on the pulpit, you are now sweating. You are not doing like this. Now, if the wife was around, the wife has already packed those handkerchiefs in her bag. That's why her bag is usually big. <laughs> <laughs> All the things that you will not know you need, she has carried it. Sometimes she will carry a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. She knows that my husband, when he's preaching, I will start coughing. And she will bring out that bottle of water and say this. I said, hey, ah, you brought it. I know now I carry this along. When we are, even though you are rushing me that we should go, I know that you need it. That's why I went back to the kitchen to carry that thing. Two are better than one. And if you will let your wife be the two that the two of you are, it's better for you. Don't let it be another woman outside who is in the loophole. Can you how terrible it is? There is another woman outside, a girl, that is coming and say, ah, ah, uncle, and he's trying to help you to rearrange your tie. Your tie. Hey, you are entering into a problem. Going. You are going, oh, you are going. And the reason is because you did not engage the two that God has put together. 
Two are better than one in all ramification. Permit it. And what will be the result? It said they will have a good reward from their labor. Even your labor is going to produce. I have found it all from my own experience and I know from our coordinator's experience, they can testify again and again that these two are better than one. These two, they will produce greater results. I have found that even when we are ministering, when me and my wife sit down together to speak into a couple or to speak into a life, oh my God, we get better results. Because when I finish talking, 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 as a man from my own male perspective, my wife says, eh, there's another side that you have not added. But then she brings that in. You know that something has happened. The people just met. They say, Kai, what mommy said is the real issue. She pointed it out. That's the way out. She's not doing that to discredit me. She's doing that to compliment me. She's doing that to complete what I'm doing. And that's what is the beauty of it. Men of the clergy, don't ignore that investment in your family life, which your wife has been to you. Don't ignore it. Don't let it be wasted. You will have a good reward for your labor. Now, if my coordinator does not have something to say on this, then we can go ahead. You have a word for us? Uh, or mute your center. <laughs> you know, these two are better than one. What better when the couple live in an embrace? You know, in an embrace, your spouse will see what you cannot see. Mm. And you are also seeing what your spouse cannot see. Mm. That way you function better. And like you said, even in ministry, you know that when you are preaching on the pulpit and you are actually looking at your wife, you know, she gives you signals that will help you whether to continue or to change gear. You know, one thing I observe with members of congregation is that even when you have wasted their time, they would like to tell you something nice. I said, Daddy, we thank you for the word of God. Ask them, what are you like? There is no single thing that they have had because you didn't say anything. So for me, after whatever people say, if I have not heard from her, you have not heard anything yet. I have not heard. It. And as I look at her, she can look in a particular way and I will know that I'm not communicating. Then I will have to change. In fact, she, we talk on the pulpit and that helps us to be able to bear fruit in ministry than if I'm going it alone. And you know, at the beginning, I didn't like it because I said, everybody is saying I've done well, but why is it that she's looking at something and she will say that this one, this one. But that's the beauty of it. If we must improve in ministry, we must listen to each other. Yes. Thank you very much. I think our brothers and sisters, you are getting what we are talking about. We are talking from the life experience God has allowed us to have. And we wanted to mark it. By the grace of God, we have been in this thing for years. And we have seen that it actually produced greater reward. Our ministries will be much more than what you, you are seeing now if you will take this cancer from the word of God. Master Shade, can you go ahead now? The second issue is how to foster a fault that these two people that God has brought together, I say, if one a fault, the other mm -hmm. one will lift up his, uh, his, his partner. Woe to him who falls when he's alone. Hey, it will be a terrible fall. So what do you say to us about that? How, to, how does our marriage make sure that we don't fall so that even if the devil is putting a trap your partner is there to say eh -eh, you won't fall here how do we engage that uh, deliberately by the grace of god right um again first of all i'm seeing there the possibility of a fall mm. god has seen ahead mm. that human beings have a possibility 
of your fall. Mm. And God, so to say, goes ahead to prevent, to, to put together a preventive measure to prevent a fall. He knows the possibility. He knows we have an enemy. The devil is never our friend. And so he, God has gone ahead of us to provide this preventive measure. He said, if they fall, that's the first word. He didn't say when they fall. God doesn't expect us to fall. Mm. If he expects us to fall, he would have said when they fall. Like he said, when you pray, it means God expects us to pray. But if you are angry, it means he doesn't expect you to be angry. If they fall, it means he doesn't expect you to fall. But mm. if it happens, mm. if they fall, one will lift up his companion. So first we need to know that God doesn't expect us to fall. That's why he posted this man or this woman into your life mm. to prevent you from falling. Let's make use of that. God will keep you from falling. God will keep you from falling. And Let's make you this in instrument, make use of this instrument. Tap into it. Don't waste this equipment. Mm. It is mm. to prevent you from falling. Mm. Don't mm. go it alone. Mm. There's somebody beside you, your spouse, mm. whom God posted there to prevent you from falling. Tap into that instrument. So he says, if they fall, one will lift up his companion. Again, I'm seeing there a companion that has enough strength to be able to lift up his companion. A companion that is deeply and firmly rooted in Christ mm -hmm. to be able to not only stand for himself or herself, but able to rescue the partner that is falling. It also now means that as individuals in the relationship of marriage, each one of us must develop our deep root in Christ. You must be deeply rooted as a person. Have a personal walk with God. The fact that you are married does not cancel your personal walk with God. When he is personally walking with God, and I am also deeply rooted in Christ and I'm personally walking with God, if there is a little shaking and a little fall, I can hold his hand while I'm deeply rooted. I'm not falling. I am standing. But I can hold his hand and say, ah, my husband, what is happening to what's you? happening to you? Mm. And I can lift him out. And both of us are not falling. So mm. I see God um, instructing each one of us to have a personal walk with God mm. in such a way that you can be able to uh, stretch <coughs> out a helping hand mm. to the one that is uh, almost falling. All right. Thank you. So if I pick it from there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, He that thinketh his stands, what should he do? Take Let him take heed lest he falls. Now, when you read that scripture on its own, it's talking about you. Take heed, take heed, take heed lest you fall. But you see, God said, God has also made a way of escape. And sometimes, we are thinking that that way of escape is arbitrary or that way of escape is abstract. But the way of escape that God has established could be your wife, could be the husband. And let's imagine that there is a, 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 a girl, and I call it tick. Eh? tick. You know a tick that, that, that when he when it comes to, to stick to the, to, to the cow. cow, to suck the, the cow, there are some people that are like tick. They want to stick to your life. They are looking for how to capture you. Since the day you enter the parish, they are planning to perish you. Now, 
Every time. Say, Pastor, I want to see you. I want to see you. And he's always waiting for when you are alone. What is the way of escape? Is it not to call your wife Eve? And say, Sister uh, Damaris, uh, want to see us. So when she comes and see you and your wife sitting there, say, Sister Damaris, welcome, please sit down. And you say you want to see or you want to praise them. Mm, uh, actually, I didn't have something to say. Because what she wanted to do, your wife has spoiled it. Is that not God's way of escape? Yes. Is that not God's provision for your escape? And man of God, don't think you are so strong that you cannot fall. He said, he that thinketh the standard should do what? Take heed, lest he falls. And part of taking heed is the provision of your marriage. Part of taking heed. Can you imagine that people are sending you texts all the time? So now, part of the heed that God says you should take it lest you fall has been provided in your partner. In your spouse, and somebody is sending texts, dangerous texts to your phone all the time. Instead of going up and down and running to the bathroom to go and open the text, your wife said, My wife, my husband, where are you going? Mm -hmm. Sit down, sit down, <laughs> give me that thing, let me read it. Is that not your way of escape? Mm -hmm. And suddenly it's your wife that read it now. And decided, okay, let me reply her for you. When she replies, the woman know that, ah, so the text I sent to him, the wife and himself, they are ready together. And the wife said, uh, we saw your text. Thank you for, for writing. Uh, but concerning what you are saying, we want to pray that God will help you. You know that that woman will say, hey, so everything I'm saying, the, the, the man, the woman is saying, I better be careful with myself now. Are you not escaping? Now, the woman God has put in your life is there to help you at your time of weakness, mm. at your time of vulnerability. That's why God put them there. Let me make a comment from a, a, comment, yes. a question that is coming somewhere and it's about this issue uh, of falling, the prevention of a fall, mm. which has become a problem for many clergy, you know, that causes a fall. Counseling a female behind closed doors. Mm. And uh, also counseling a female alone, mm. which has become like a trap, a snare for many clergy. We want to mm. advise that when counseling a female, even if your wife is not there, it's very uh, much better to counsel them in the open. Open the door. Counsel them where others can be passing and watching, even though they are not listening. But people can see you. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. When you counsel behind closed doors, it may result in something that you don't expect. And then it's better, actually, if you have helped your wife to be spiritual enough, she can help you to counsel the females. But the best thing is to counsel them together. See. Two of you sit together <clears throat> and counsel these uh, opposite sex together rather than being alone as a man of God, counseling the female, the opposite sex, and then counseling them behind closed doors. Right, it's a danger. Thank you very much. So, why we are talking about for stalling a fall, we are saying that God had made this provision. But one thing that she has said is that each one of us in matrimony, the husband, the wife, must be deeply rooted in Christ. You must be sensitive to Christ. You must know the Word of God. So that when you see deviation and you see who else can easily notice deviation in the life, it's your spouse. Eh? Imagine that you used to wake up 4 a.m. to pray before. 
And when you wake up, you are crying to God, you are crying to God. Your wife knows that my husband has gone to pray. But now you are sleeping till 6.30 a.m. And the time you are, you are waking up, say, give me my cup of uh, coffee. <laughs> she said, but you have not prayed. She said, leave that thing alone, I'm hungry. And then she watches you from morning to afternoon to evening. There's no prayer again. Now, church members don't know that. You can still bring a microwave salmon. Yeah? Mm -hmm. A salmon that you preached from the three years ago, you just microwave it, you just warm it and put one chorus in between and present it. You can do that. Church members, mm -hmm. are, they don't understand. They don't know the thing you are still moving. But your husband knew that, hey, my husband has not been praying. His prayer life has died. No one else can quickly locate it except her. That's the person that can help you quickly. I say, my husband, I think our prayer life is dying. Let's, let's just take time and pray. I think we should fast together. That is the kind of help we are talking about. And when the husband notices that you are getting jittery about everything, you are getting jittery. And he says, yeah, 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 leave me alone. What are you talking about? You are talking too much. <laughs> Your husband said, my wife, something has changed. This is not how you are. I know you are a prayerful man. You don't shout like this. Why? What's happening to you? Then, you know, everything is cut. I say, no, no, we are missing it somewhere. Let's go for a retreat. It is the woman inside your life that can know when you are deviating. Honestly speaking, nobody falls suddenly. All the popular fall, they have been small, 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 small falls. Small, 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 pitfall, pitfall, pitfall until it become a final fall. Mm. So the need not to fall, God has made it possible by putting somebody in your life who can see it just when it is beginning. Just when it is beginning. Imagine that you before, but now your wife sees that you are watching uh, this uh, movie. Uh, movie. She woke up to go to the toilet. She still sees you watching. She came back and tried to sleep. By the time she woke up again, you are still watching. Then she said, oh, what are you watching? What are you watching? Said, hey, hey, leave me alone. Leave me alone. You are going. And sometimes when you know that she's likely to see, you quickly use uh, 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 the airpiece so that you are, you are, you are going. <laughs> All of those things. And then there is that small clue, you just click. So that she doesn't know that that thing you, are, you have done. When she looks away, you go back. You are going, you are going. That's the only woman, that's the only man that God has put to forestall your fall, your oneness, your closeness, your fellowship is all part of God's purpose for you not to fall. May God help you not to fall in the name of Jesus. Now, uh, uh, Sister Geta, you want to say something or you want us to move on a bit more? I think you've hit the nail on the head. The, okay. One of the benefits of marriage is the insight into mm. the strengths, the weaknesses, the tendencies in each mm. other yes. that nobody outside knows. No. And this is a privilege so that we can help each other. Mm. And I say 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2 uh, when Paul was answering the letter on the question of sex in marriage, he said, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Mm. So uh, the idea is meant to forestall uh, immoral, falling in immorality. Mm. So we, the marriage relationship, God has put it together to be a safeguard in the different directions, you know, uh, when if we were to highlight the areas that men of God are falling easily, sexual immorality is one of them. Very one. Well Money is another, and pride, and so on. But God has brought us as spouses to forestall that form. So, as a wife, uh, you are there to help your husband not to fall into sexual immorality. All right, thank you. Husband, 
God has provided your wife so that you will not fall. Thank and you. Nobody should ever say that they can never fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true, there are provisions in scripture to keep us never to fall. But because we don't stay by those provisions, we can fall. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge for us. Amen. And, Amen. and let me say just one sentence. Mm -hmm. Let us please receive that help from one another. Mm. It's one thing for God to make a provision. It's another thing to receive it. Wow. Let's receive it. Mm. 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 Please do not, do not waste the grace of God. I think a scripture says, I beseech you, eh, brethren, not to receive the grace of God in vain. It is grace that God has provided in our marriages. Don't let it be wasted. As far as the word of God is concerned, God has made sure that any of us that is married should not fall. Should not fall. You must not fall into obesity. Your wife is there to watch the kind of food you eat. So number uh, the next point there that we want to look at is to create warmth. Warmth. Would you like to introduce that to us uh, in a short while? Right. Yes. Um, that's verse, verse um, 11. Mm. Again, if two lie down together, First Corinthians, I mean, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 11. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. Or how can one be warm alone. That also is telling us that we need warmth. We need warmth in order to carry on in our relation, in our ministries. We need spiritual warmth. We need physical warmth. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, ministry, there will be inertia. We will not be able to take off quickly and uh, minister. We need warmth. And God again has made provision, he has made this provision of marriage in order for us to keep warm. The physical warmth is necessary as husband and wife. And we know the warmth we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Warmth, of course, warmth uh, spiritually, warmth of fellowship, but physical warmth in terms of conjugal relationship. Mm -hmm. We need that warmth as husband and wife mm -hmm. in ministry. Uh, you may say, ah, what is that to spiritual ministry? Mm -hmm. Let's forget about that. No. Mm -hmm. That's why many men are falling. Mm -hmm. We need to provide the conjugal warmth for one another. Mm -hmm. Even though when you are growing old, it may be reducing, but the need is there. All the time. All the time. Conjugal warmth. You remember one man in the Bible who began to feel cold even in his old age. Mm. <laughs> and I thought it was the cold that could be relieved by hot tea and blanket. And blanket. But they put all kinds of, of royal blankets. And David was not warm. And David was not warm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Until they brought a young lady with warm, you know. <laughs> and then they put this lady in his bosom. Then all the sickness of cold disappeared. disappeared. Hey. So <laughs> the warmth we are talking about cannot be provided by blanket mm. or hot tea. Mm. This warmth is the physical conjugal relationship together. All right. Thank and you. we must not neglect it. Mm. Man of God, woman of God, you are provided for each other by God. Mm. In order to keep you warm, mm. don't don't um, don't forsake, don't neglect this warmth. Mm. Don't be too spiritual mm. Mm. as to mm. uh, receive that warmth, because there are people like that in the spirit. Uh -huh, they are in the spirit. Well, even woman of God, mm -hmm. don't be too much in the spirit as to provide the warmth for your husband. A man of God. Do you know that even the woman can feel cold? Mm. And you are there, spiritual, 
And you won't provide that warmth for your wife. We must provide this warmth of, of conjugal relationship. Mm. And then the warmth of, uh, warmth of spiritual fellowship. Mm. We should fellowship together as husband and wife. Mm. Don't be alone, man of God. You are too spiritual to be able to sit with your wife and, and, and share together spiritual fellowship for warmth in the family. Warmth as a couple. We must provide that warmth for each other so that the enemy has no, no space to enter between us. Right. Thank you very much. I know that every time we come for family clinic, we can never finish. It's an inexhaustible matter we are raising here. Even if we stop now, we have already got something to chew. Now, you know, when we read that uh, Ecclesiastes 4, I read my own uh, message. And verse 11 said, two in a bed warm each other. Alone, you shiver all night. <laughs> <laughs> eh? How many of you are shivering all night? <laughs> so, the blanket that you need to keep you warm is in each other. And we have talked about it in all the ways. Warmth of encouragement. You came back, somebody is there to say, welcome, my husband. It's different from when you return, you have preached, 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 you are coming back. Nobody at home to welcome you. And uh, even when she was to welcome you, she's already sleeping. And your food is in the is in the is, warmer. is in the warmer. They say when you come, let him take his food in the warmer, madam. Mm, your husband may now begin to say, okay, since even if I go, my food is in the warmer. Let me just stay with this woman that can warm me up here, and then a strange woman is coming in. Let's be careful. So this relationship has been created to create warmth. She has said warmth of spiritual fellowship want of physical sharing, want of conjugal, conjugal relationship in bed. Don't separate your bed, please. No matter how big you have become, the marriage bed must remain undefined. We want you to maintain that bed together. We don't have time to discuss that uh, uh, elaborately now, but like we have discussed, this matter is becoming a critical matter that we cannot ignore among the men and women of the clergy. God will help us. Now, I think because of our time and the way we have moved today, we are going to stop. The last issue that we will have discussed is that we form a formidable team in spiritual warfare. When the two of you combine together, to fight against the devil, he will turn and run. Don't let yourselves be fighting spiritual battle alone. Combine together. But say, if two of you shall agree as touching anything you will ask on earth, it shall be done for you. So we want to recommend that even in spiritual warfare, the formidable team that God has formed is you and your wife. Stand together. If the devil is coming one way, your wife is firing here, you are firing there. The devil say, hey, these people are together. God is and the Christ. Bible say, where two of you have agreed, I will be there. Mm -hmm. God is in your midst. So the third court, the third court that cannot be fold, and that, that third fold court that cannot be broken is the Lord himself in your midst. Where two of you have agreed, God is there. So this is the reason why your oneness is important. The Bible says how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There, God commands blessing. So let's take note of this, that your oneness, your agreement together in the place of prayer attracts God, attracts his presence. And so praying and standing together in ministry is a great provision. Again, I would like to recommend that uh, please go on our uh, use YouTube or whatever and look for the, uh, the series of uh, the Couples Retreat of 2022. That series, 
We deal with different issues and we believe it will be of help to you. If you can download it, you can use it for your personal training. You can use it to organize a couples retreat for your pastors. God will use it to bless you. Different issues were dealt with. Several couples made input and we are sure that God will bless you with it. And if you take the materials, the books, whatever you have on your hand, read it together. We actually recommend that couples should read this book together. We keep introducing it. You know, we hope that God will bless it in your hand as we go ahead. Thank you very much again for this opportunity of uh, our family clinic. Over to our brother David and uh, to lead us to conclude in prayer. Okay, I'll ask my wife to pray for us now. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank you for the clinic today. We thank you again for showing us the blockages, the losses we've had in our relationship as men and women of the clergy. Father, we want to pray that you will help us to deal with them, to bridge the gap. Father, thank you because you brought us together for greater fruitfulness. You brought us together, oh God, to forestall a form. You brought us together to create warmth, to form a team that will fight this warfare and win for you, to give us power to bind and loose our Father and our God. What a privilege. Help us to go from here, availing of ourselves of these great provisions and doing better in life and ministry. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.